Cameron Price is a graduate of Forest Science and a candidate for a Master of Sustainability. He is deeply involved in sustainability education and consultancy worldwide, with roles ranging from training at the Australian College of Business Intelligence to advising at green tech startups, Yenatech, and Climateers, and providing sustainability consulting for Synersham and Strategy in Ops, his work focuses on implementing nature-based solutions and advancing ecosystem restoration. He is passionate about making a tangible impact on biodiversity conservation and sustainable operations. So nature-based solutions. This is about using living systems to help resolve and solve some of the problems that we face as a society. So it's becoming quite popular and even well-funded. There's a number of funding mechanisms that are really driving nature-based solutions, including carbon credits. So there's very significant areas of forest being planted. It's also being used to address other challenges like food insecurity, biodiversity loss, and, and water security. So it's been around for a while, even though it's only just been really picked up and um, run with in recent years. But it was back in 2016 that it was defined as actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address a societal challenge, effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So one of the, the key characteristics I'd want to draw your attention to here is that nature-based solutions, even though they're using ecosystem processes and, and natural systems, they're designed to address societal problem. So for example, adaptation to the threats of climate change. And it can also be used, there are all other societal benefits that can come from this. For example, it can provide a livelihood and economic benefits for the farmers or communities where these projects are run. So the overarching goal is primarily one of society's development and safeguarding human well-being simultaneously um, enhancing and protecting natural conservation and biodiversity values. So these are some of the main challenges that it addresses uh, that I was wanting to particularly focus on today is um, the climate crisis. By, uh, for example, planting vegetation, trees, they, it sequesters carbon. So it's drawing down carbon from the atmosphere and therefore it's helping mitigate the or offset the carbon that's emitted from human sources such as fossil fuels and food waste and, and, and transport. So the, the IUCN, which is the peak body for nature conservation globally, has come up with a document that if you're interested in this, to pursue this in more detail, it's worth finding and, and sourcing a copy, the Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions. So it provides a framework and a shared understanding of what nature-based solutions are. So it has criteria and indicators, so it's a really good detailed guide and it covers um, what a common language and approach that project operators and funders of nature-based solutions can use. So it covers things like the process for designing a solution, how to ensure that it's environmentally sustainable, social equity considerations, um, economic viability, because the project, it needs to not only just be funded initially, 
but it needs to have either ongoing funding or some means of generating revenue to sustain it over time. And also adaptive management, it, it talks about the principles of how the project can accommodate changes over time. And ultimately, the idea is to integrate and embed these systems into the local systems so that then it's it's sustainable. So I'll give a few a few examples. One of them is municipalities can use it as a means of managing stormwater, for example. So often in towns, these large concrete drains need to accommodate for the peak flows of you know, one in a hundred year flood. And so you end up with these massive, you would have seen them, ugly concrete drains that go right through the middle of urban areas. By using a nature-based solution, so for example, having a, a wetland, the reeds absorb the energy from that water and also through evapotranspiration can soak up a lot of the water. So that means that in the end, there's less cost and less physical infrastructure required to accommodate for these peak water flow events. And there's also side benefits. So the vegetation, it can provide some uh, aesthetic value. So you know, can have walking paths and bike paths along these artificial wetlands. It can enhance um, or any vegetation improves the, you know, the, the air quality, for example. The other thing that it can do is provide a basis for biodiversity conservation by incorporating multiple species in these programs or using them on degraded land, we can also achieve ecosystem restoration goals. So at the moment, we're within the decade of ecological restoration that the UN has designated for, for, for this decade. Another, another thing that they can be used for is in addition to sequestering carbon, trees such as mangroves planted in the, the ecotone or the overlap along the, in coastal areas can help absorb storm surge because one of the implications of climate change is that not only is the average sea level rising, but the frequency and severity of storm surge is also increasing. And so these mangroves help buffer areas adjacent to the ocean. So it could be urban areas or agricultural land that could otherwise suffer um, erosion or, or water damage. It can, they can also be used in the context of developing countries to provide a range of diversity of revenue sources. So uh, food trees can provide um, fruit, they can provide fodder for animals, as well as sequestering carbon. Another thing is that they can be used in urban contexts as green infrastructure. So green space of parks have multiple benefits for residents in urban areas. I mean, it helps, it's, it's, there are plenty of studies that show that there are mental health benefits where you have park and space to go and spend time. The other thing is there is in cities, a thing called the uh, island heat effect. So all of the concrete tends to absorb solar radiation and get warmer and warmer and warmer. So these very high temperatures 
can have implications for comfort, but also he um, health implications. People who are either very young or very old or have compromised health can be vulnerable to heat stroke. And, and heat stroke is actually the highest number of deaths associated with climate change. Um, so by having green infrastructure, it helps reduce this heat island effect in cities. So you can have green walls, green roofs, as well as the traditional green spaces. So overall nature-based solutions, it's, it's an approach to help address some of the complex social and environmental challenges that we face. So it's using living systems to help address both the biodiversity and the climate crises.